Bulls, and I'm going to switch to one player that you work with since he was five or six, because I'm curious. We talked earlier about players developing, players making it, players that get over the hump, that accomplish their dream goals. And I, I was curious, Al, when they're children, what are the qualities that you've noticed in those players? And the one I want to bring up, of course, is your most famous player, Sidney Crosby. Yeah. What, uh, how old was he when he started? Tell me about what you remember about him as a young boy beginning at your school. I'm sure he could skate when he come to your school, but if you wouldn't mind sharing your knowledge of the traits he seemed to have that well, set him apart. Yeah, and McKinnon came for years as well, and so he got four points again yesterday. He's a 109 now. He's ahead. But anyway, uh, Sydney came when he was about five. He says five or six, so I guess he didn't remember exactly what day, but he's very young. And uh, he was always hungry to learn. He always did what he was asked to do. And uh, he had come up through our system and he used to come over for numerous weeks every every summer. And uh, and uh, he'd uh, uh, he he graduated to a demonstrator, and when they get their goal skate, they can become a demonstrator, and they sort of demonstrate and learn how to coach, and and he came through that. Then he was a junior instructor, and he, so he left when he was about fourteen. It was the last time he was there, but he came back to train some, and we've. Al, Al, to... I need. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but for those that are listening, Al's hockey school. He teaches fundamental skills. Nobody does that I know. And when he has a demonstrator, they can do the skating skill perfectly. And they wear these jerseys with demonstrator on their back, but they are able to demonstrate the fundamentals of Mohawk pivots, forward stride, backward strides, tight turns, like details that are missing today in every level that I watch. Nobody skates technically as well as those demonstrators and Al I've always felt that watching them graduate to become a demonstrator you have a skating program that did they all go through it to reach a gold yeah. standard as a computerized program and we had some help to develop a, the, that during the 80s there was a dad that was really good at computing and and wanted to know if, if he if he developed the program for us, uh, whether his sons could come to hockey school. And I said sure. So, so it was a trade off. And and you know I I had coached in I had coached for years. And uh, uh, when I started the the other program, we didn't mean to start. I was working with I was provincial youth coordinator with Department of Education, and so I had a pretty solid government job. And uh, as you as you might say, so I I just uh, never meant to start a hockey school. I wanted to get kids together, uh, maybe thirty kids for three years, and and uh, and and meet with researchers. And I met with Gaston Marcotte at Laval University, and he was one of the leading researchers in skating at the time. And I drove I aboard my brother's old Honda Civic, and I drove to Laval, and went in. And he wasn't overly welcoming he, he I think he just wanted to get to get through it and uh, I, I couldn't speak English and he he uh, or French rather and he he didn't well he, he spoke both but I think he was more comfortable in French and but when he saw I was hungry he got he got really excited because the teacher's always looking for the student right and he got up and started demonstrating in his office and and he, he gave me all a little a whole lot of research that I had translated and on skating and came down and spent time down in PEI and and uh, it, it was a wonderful gift to, to have met him. And then I started doing the re uh, following the research of Dr. Wayne Marino and and a bunch of uh, Larry Holt at Dell with Pierre Paget and all those guys and and started to learn proper techniques and what the research was saying, not just somebody's, you know, doing figure skating moves and stuff like that. Although I worked with figure skaters one summer. Uh, and learned what 
would apply to a, a great hockey skating program and backward striding, forward striding, sharp turns. Although they're the uh, position of the body is different, it's uh, the the bottom part of the body is the same in the skating those skating skills. So anyway, so we. Uh, uh, we got to start it, and after a while, I was taking a couple of weeks off every summer. And the, and, and the deputy minister of education in 1985 said, "You know what?" He said, "I think you got to do one thing or the other." <laughs> so I said, "I guess I'll do the other." And uh, and so I put in my resignation, and and uh, it, I, it was actually job sharing. Somebody else came in and did my job for the summer, and the next spring, uh, government was promoting that, uh, and. Uh, but I, I had already resigned, and so we had to go ahead and develop it or starve to death. <laughs> but yeah, I guess I'm I, going in circles, Wally, so you better keep asking me questions. <laughs> well, the question I've got here, it, it's more of why am I asking these questions and bringing these points out. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier, I'm watching AA, AAA practices, and they can do the drills, they play pretty good. But quite frankly, they can't skate fundamentally like you teach. And the one example I have, and it, you know, to, uh, I bring it up with Tom's team, the backward skating, and if they can't stride, they really can't play the game. So there's a lot of skaters out there that wiggle, they don't stride, they don't develop power, they don't have posture. And they're doing the best they can, but they haven't been taught how to stride and mohawk pivot. In fact, they're giving up on it with surfing. My point, Al, and we're going to get back to Sydney and those other great ones, is when they became demonstrators and instructors, they could do everything that you well, need to well, you get on the ice at the NHL level. I, they learned, a lot of, I learned a lot of backward striding it with the figure skaters and uh, uh, one of the, one one of the guys used to work with Doug Shepard. He's got a picture of Sydney. Sent it to him, and he said, "On a Doug, thanks for teaching me the forward C cut, start, uh, forward C cut." And so you, it's C cuts, and and when you're backward striding, you, you one foot has to go straight, and the other one C cuts, and and it has to come right into the heel. Although you don't always use it in in the actual game, it's better to do the whole thing like a. If you were boxing, you'd you'd start with a a straight right. You you wouldn't start with a jab because a jab is part of a straight right. And so, so uh, in in the, in the game situation, you don't always use a a full pump, but it's there if you need it. And so we have our skaters. They'll skate around the net, and and they'll come to the blue line. They'll mohawk towards the the boards, and then at full speed. And they, they can backward stride and they don't lose any speed. They can go just as fast backward striding. And then we go the other way to make sure they, they can mohawk, oh, open mohawk. If forward to backward is, is, is a little different, but when they turn on the other blue line to go forward, they open up. And I see if you cross over, you're, you're dead in the water. McDavid and those guys love the guys that cross over because once they cross over, they're gone. You know, you're, you're caught. So you don't cross over, but I see them all the time in, in the NHL. They're they're crossing over, and and uh, some of the superstars can skate a little bit and backwards. And uh, and uh, then I see them going for the pucks, and they're not shoulder checking. And we teach that in novice, uh, you know, shoulder checking, and they know why, you know, so that they can see where the pressure is and where their support is, and they learn all those things as novice, and they teach it. And kids. I think one of the things, Wally, that I, we've spoken about is that uh, people who coach have got to realize how brilliant kids are. And Wally has a great saying that um, that you don't look to see how how, how smart uh, how smart a kid is. You look to see how a, a kid is smart. And and they all have different pluses and minuses, like all of us adults. And 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 you treat you treat the novices like like people, like adults, and you involve them. And, and believe in them, and and you got to be patient because it takes it takes a lot of repetition to get that. And uh, Dr. Jean Maher, who was a was a mentor when I was at UNB, uh, he says it's not how many new things you teach, it's how many things you remind them uh, about uh, 
uh, what they already know. It's like Tommy's wife keep trying to get him to take the garbage out. She got to keep reminding them. And, but anyway, we're all like that, I guess. But it, it's it's, del it's delightful, like to to work with young people. And I'm not able to coach now as much as I as I was, and I I really miss it. And uh, and and the kids from all over the world come, and there's no difference. They're all the same. One little uh, Chinese boy, I was I was I was working with his team, and. And we'd bring the kids in, and he'd, he'd tell me exactly what I was going to say. He was eight, eight or nine. He'd tell me exactly what I was going to say before I said it. And the funny part of it was he was always right. <laughs> and and kids are they're so brilliant. They can do things that, and our, we make our drills complicated. So they think they learn to think on the ice, and they learn to uh, understand, and 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 they learn to. Uh, teach. I, am I on there, Wally, or do, am I gone? Yeah, you are. Okay. Uh, so anyway, you better ask me another question because I tend to drift, Wally. You're a pretty good drifter. <laughs> okay, listen, uh, I, I'm i glad Al came on because uh, years ago, um, in our, my our generation, and, and I'm I'm sure everybody will appreciate this, the generation that Al grew up in and I grew up in of coach education, he mentioned some, he dropped some names that none of you have ever heard of. Marcotte, Mahar, uh, back in that era, there was, the science of coaching, biomechanics, was part of coach education. And coaches learned to break down skills and build up skills. And we did a whole part whole methodology. So we're sort of geared in that. We're focused on that. And without that base, you can't play the game tactically as well as you should or could. So that base is something that average coaches don't teach anymore. And I don't know that there's that many specialists that can even teach it like Alan does at his schools out <laughs> out east um, and it's really and I'm sure you know my hair is getting grayer I'm not losing it much but when I watch it I just see so many uh, teams go two hard laps between drills and the team I had last night I talked to the coach who I was evaluating for development one and I just reminded her have them do some striding laps just sit tall ride a horse get that posture better because they can't skate backwards. They can skate, but it's not as fundamentally sound as it could be so they can play a more advanced game. And that's my point is we've got to master those fundamentals somehow. And <coughs> the skill between drills idea, and that means striding backwards, forward striding and gliding with a good side push. These are fundamentals that, oh, we just get into the drills, we get into the games, and we can teach skating. I would like to compliment one coach last night who has been doing exaggerated deep squat skating. And I watched his team practice yesterday. Their knees were ahead of their toes. They could skate. They had power in their strides. So kudos to him. He did a fundamental regression a deliberate around the rink, almost a half squat, full squat, pushing to the side. Hey, yeah, it's not a waste of time. It's time that has to be spent. But today's coaches, we get caught up and compete in the games. And now playoffs are on. All we're worried about is winning those games. And I just don't know where in the season and at what age. We're going to pay attention to those details because, when, Sammy, when we got to the national team, we paid attention to those details. We had 27 hours, one-out sessions, one-hour sessions with a skating specialist with our national team doing the same thing Al's doing in his camps. Kim, go ahead. Okay. Your sound I'm on now. I'm a bit that slow. But I think one thing that's interesting, right, is, and I'm coaching U9, like forever now, for the next who knows how many years, with my daughters. And 
you know, I, we work a lot on fundamentals, obviously they need, they need it. Uh, but I think, you know, maybe and it's different because I'm coaching only girls uh, and don't coach the boys. There's a tremendous value in things like tag, uh, especially at the young ages, all the variations of it to even just observe who has an outside edge, who can stop and start, who can't turn one way. Um, and, you know, to use things like that, you know, I watch a lot of development sessions at our own organization, other organizations, and I love line skating for the technical pieces. But I think if we're trying to engage a younger audience, we need to find different ways to embrace the chaos uh, and, and embrace their mindset. Because, you know, as much as an efficient stride and the proper outside edge and all that control is important, the kids that are the best, best skaters at the young age who are effective in a game situation are, are the ones who can change direction, are the ones who can stop and start. And, and it's not actually at U9, the rate limiting step isn't who can go fastest in a straight line necessarily. It's who can you know, cut in and cut out and turn back to get herself in a straight line to then break away. And unfortunately we're on full ice, so there's far too many full ice breakaways. Um, but with my, my middle daughter, who's a pretty good little skater, much better than me. Um, you know, we used to do three three drills on the little backyard rink, and it was really small, Wally. Uh, this was back when it was actually cold enough in Toronto to sustain an outdoor rink, so like four or five years ago. We did three drills. We would play tag. Her, her younger sister, her older brother, me and me and my husband, we'd play tag, 10 minutes. You're it, we're it, freeze tag, whatever. Then we would play, I call it grenades. It's basically anything we had on the ice balls, cones, pucks, we would shoot it at the kids' feet. So they had to know where we were and look over their shoulder and figure out where everybody else is and pick up their feet. So this is how I you know, taught them to be comfortable standing on one foot or the other. So I would strategically shoot it at their left foot or their right foot so that they would lift up the other foot or else they'd just skate with one leg. And then we would play, and this one is actually the one that I think has gotten uh, my daughter and then the players I coach the furthest, which I, I call thief in the night, which is you flip your stick over and you got the ring at ring and you have to protect the ring from someone else lifting your stick, which even the four and five year olds can do. And that one for puck protection and body control has been really, really transformational for all our players. And so I think it's, you know, to me, those are all skating drills um, and, you know, all often infused Maybe not in between drills, like you're saying, Wally, like, but certainly five minute breaks within our, our practices or, you know, 15 minutes at the beginning of our practices. If you just did those three drills again and again and again, all of a sudden you've got players, especially on half ice, who can really protect the puck, who can really change direction, uh, who are really, really comfortable. And then I might argue, you know, we then, as they transition to full ice, focus more on stride fundamentals and all of those details um because of that how i'm just curious maybe alan's thoughts or anyone on this call's thoughts what our priorities are in terms of teaching when we're half ice because i haven't taught any stride i've taught i've taught them how to skate backwards and how to forward stride sorry in basic terms but i'm not teaching it in the way i was taught it as like your sole mode of transportation to get down the ice because on half ice you almost never get into full stride so it doesn't actually um, translate into success in the same way. So I'm I'm curious if maybe we should think about the curriculum a little differently and maybe flip-flop priorities um, when the, the kids are more confined. And I'd be curious, and you guys might know, in you know, countries like Sweden and Finland, when they play on even smaller ice for longer periods of time with the kids, are they focusing on different fundamentals, more edge work, less stride? I don't know the answers. I'm just testing it out with my own players. Uh, it seems to be working pretty well. So I'm, I'm just curious everyone's thoughts on that in terms of skating development with half ice games. Well, Kim, well, that's we, exactly the issue. And I'm going to ask Al to comment, but before he does, uh, small area games, they require more turns, more stops, more awareness. You do develop playing small area games. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I'm sorry, I wasn't on when you started. Is that Sammy Joe? No, that's Kim. Okay. Kim McCullough. Kim that McCullough. was Kim McCullough okay. talking. 
But this oh, is Sammy Joe also. Hi. But Kim's the really smart one. I just listen. Anyway, uh, I'm just saying. <laughs> Thanks, Sammy. Everybody's well, gone to the game-like mode, the whole method, play the game, pick it up, and there's no doubt my favorite game is tag. Yeah, it's, it's, it's those small area games are amazing, and uh, it teaches uh, balance. It teaches switching speeds and ducking and all kinds of things that apply to the game, and uh, they're wonderful. And we interject those, you know, in different times over the years. And and uh, but those are wonderful. Anything that's innovative is is good from my perspective. And Kim, you're really innovative, so you should be inventing new ones. <laughs> you, you got the capability. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting. We we so when we practice, U9 got 30 skaters on the ice at the same time. Uh both our rep teams together. We have about eight eight coaches. Although last night we had like nobody. It was felt like I was at hockey school by myself. It was a bit of an adventure. But eight coaches, typically 30 to 34 skaters. And so, you know, trying to keep them all engaged. You know, they are competitive, but there's a huge difference between top and bottom, like massive. And, you know, how are we infusing edge work and fundamental skating skills where, you know, the line skating or the cross ice skating or however you're going to do it. You know, I find personally with that age group, I've, I've got like 15 minutes of that type of skating before it all goes, you know, to seed. So we've actually started doing a lot of um, like around the stick drills. So they put their sticks down on the ice together so like i don't know those of you who have video like they're like this so the it's like a long stick and then they do like inside edges outside edges you know and then we play tag around these sticks and i can get like 30 minutes of that they never get bored like and and it's really easy logistically for those of you who are coaches and, and hockey school instructors like you don't need to get them in lines there's no cones there's no corralling of anybody Right. You can teach from the middle and you don't even need to bring anything with you because it's their own sticks on the ice. Um, but for the young kids, it's it's been really good. And then I started doing drills where it's like chaos. They jump over the sticks. They turn around the sticks like of everybody's sticks. There's 34 sticks on the ice and they're just using that to execute different skating skills around. So, yeah, definitely like being creative. But I'm just finding this my second year coaching you nine. The, the down ice skating which I watch a lot of boys practices at that level or that age group, sorry. Um, and girls, and it's a lot of that linear down ice skating. And I, I, I just don't see the level of engagement um, from everybody that I do when it's a little bit more chaotic, obviously mixed in with a little bit more of that, that linear stuff, but I, I'm finding it's really translating well. So, so actually the first half of the year, it's all edge work and change of direction. And the second half, when we unfortunately get to full ice, I start teaching stride, but I don't, I don't teach it at the beginning of the year. So it's, it, it flipped my brain, this half ice stuff from how I normally would have t taught it. Like if I had U11 or U13, I would have start, started with stride and then got to change a direction. But now with the, the little ones, uh, I flipped it around. So st still to be determined whether it's the right or the wrong way to do it, but it, it does mean they can all deke someone out one-on-one. -on -one. They can all defend a one-on-one. -on -one. They all have a lot more agility than than uh, players that have done just a little bit more up and down skating. I'm just going to ask Greg Rivak, chaos, and what Kim's talking about, uh, because I know, Craig, uh, that you're really into this kind of uh, whole method of learning. Can you co comment on that, what, what we've been talking about, Greg? Yeah, um, I, I'm 100% with Kim on chaos is really good, especially at the younger ages, because um, there's a, a bit you can teach, but a lot of it doesn't get conceptualized and, and sunk really deep until they're able to think a little bit further. So pro probably like squirts, especially for the elite ones. Um, I think it's U10, but uh, squirt level. But I love the chaos. I think from how do we teach it line is kind of the the old way and finding new ways to create whether it be chaos um, i love a, a good one called uh, follow the leader just you can follow the leader all the way around so the coach can provide a great demonstration and the kids can follow around and just get them moving uh, particularly at those younger ages and then just finding ways to, to put in chaos and uh, you can do constraints led approach where you get points for doing certain maneuvers 
rather than just going for straight up goals um, and finding ways to encourage the movement pattern that you want. Um, but I mean, there's still the, the tried and true, you know, progressions. How do we get there um, and finding ways to teach rather than just pure chaos all the time. Um, but th th there's value to both sides and it's how do we utilize those as coaches and when's the right timing and whether that be in a season, in an ice session, in an age group, et cetera. Sammy, what are your thoughts? <laughs> Being a goalie, now coaching and playing defense. I mean, I love this conversation and running a hockey school now for the 27th year. I feel like I am really reliant on, well, the Sharks, which has been amazing, uh, but also on the younger instructors that are coming through and what they are learning in their different systems as, as well. So, um, yeah, I love Kim's ideas for, especially for the younger age groups. It's um, really great, but there's also, you know, something to be said as a mechanical engineer. And I think Wally, every time you talk about biomechanics, I get super excited. I I do like the fundamentals as well. And so, you know, time and place for everything. And in a week-long hockey school, the beauty of it is you get to do it all, which is amazing, which I love. So that's my comments. Love listening to all you really smart people. So the problem is, Sammy, we've done hockey schools, every one of us, and we've done the breakdowns. We've done the whole part, whole method. And I think expecting coaches to do what we do uh, and adapt like we do, um, it, it's the most difficult and challenging thing for me. And I'm trying to get them, uh, Kim and uh, uh, Craig mentioned the follow the leader. Well, I have a game where you follow the leader slowly in groups of three and you change who the leader is and you increase the space or reduce it without a puck and then with a puck. <clears throat> I mean, they got to turn both ways. And uh, can you teach turning? And yeah, you can, but boy, they all get it sooner than later playing a game like that. And that's one thing that I've found watching U13, they cannot, two things, they cannot evasive tight turn with a puck. And they can't translate that into a breakout in a game. U13, double A hockey. They can't use the evasive tight turn in the offensive zone to game time and space. And those that can don't look and see the ice to make plays. Now, the one or two kids that go on, they can do it. Not great. And I'm observing U15s and U18 players here. I don't see hockey IQ with the combination of tactical skills being used. So I'm well, caught up with how can we get all players to keep improving? And when I look at Al's players that have come out of his school and the two names that we've started this with, Sidney Crosby and Nathan McKinnon, fundamentally, they're probably the number one and two fundamental, have, have the best fundamental base of any of them. The only yeah. other player I would compare to them skating-wise is Barzell. He's yeah. done some very special work on it. But that's that's my uh, my concern and my role as a mentor this year was how to get them to evasive tight turn. And, of course, the first thing I noticed is breakaway skating. Kim, you say whole ice hockey. Well, you got to you got to be able to break away skate and blow ice hockey if you want to win games. And that means don't hold two hands on the stick and get the puck in your feet that you can't accelerate. So those things can be taught in a fun way and a competitive way, but they do have to be taught and spend time on them. And I don't think it's a lot of time. It's just teach it. It gets done. They need to be reminded of it, like Al mentioned. Uh, one of his uh, sports scientists said, uh, it's just a reminder of what you've done already. So, Al, do you have any comments to throw in? And then I want to uh, just ask Jordan for a question or two. Al? Well, well Wally, we start all of our programs, like if we have an hour and a half in the ice, the first half hour goes to skating. 
in every aspect and and the youngest because if you can't skate you can't build on it you can't build anything else on your on your on your skill level you know it's hard to carry a puck and go in different directions if you don't know skating technique and and so that's uh, if i had an hour and a half what i normally do with the spring team i'd i'd have uh, two two hour and a half sessions and uh we would have a first half hour skating each time and sometimes 20 minutes, some mostly a half hour. And then we do uh, get into our hockey foundations and, and drill levels and all that, those kinds of things. But we teach the kids to teach and uh, uh, they, they teach on the ice, they teach in classroom and a lot of it's personal development because you can teach a lot of kids a lot of things, but if they don't know how to, deal with people and meet people and their communication skills have to be good and our kids get up and teach after the first practice or so in the class they get up and 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 they, they'll go through everything and they'll they'll say new things that you've never heard people say before because and they can team teach and if they're if you use a positive approach to that every time they get up you they get applaud from their teammates and then they'll start with teaching on the ice. And, and so we develop coaches. So in our hockey schools, they're all graduates. So it's e easy to pass on skills when every level. And, and when I, I brought a peer education program uh, uh, from the Dallas School Board to the Maritime Schools uh, way back in, in mid 70s. And, and the person that did his uh, thesis on that, uh, the the end result, there were strong indications that kids learn more from the peer education than they do the lecture technique. technique. And, and so we've integrated that into our schools where the demonstrators demonstrate and teach because sometimes a, a child will see a pro out there and he's, well, he's a pro, he can do it. But when they see somebody their own age do it, then they say, well, if he can do it, uh, I can do it. It's just more believable to them. And so that's been a major success in our program and all of the those guys that come through our system. And I think we have 10 playing in the NHL now and many, many more in, in minor pros in Europe and all over and a lot of coaches. A lot of guys are coaching all over the place and, and people like like uh, like uh, Ben Cameron, who's the physician for Team Canada now. He was, he was uh, I, I coached him for a long time and he was tough. <laughs> and we had to deal with him pretty strongly, but he's a wonderful guy and and brilliant and and so we, we try to, to we try to develop people uh, that you know to to be there and to develop a dream after the dream so they can put all that together. So it's may, maybe it sounds complicated, but once the system is developed, it it works well. It's it you see a lot of kids going on to to different professions and teaching and. Uh, entrepreneurship and all those kinds of things, because all those uh, things are part and parcel of how we teach young people. Now, I'm going to, uh, uh, before I go to Kim, I'm going to come back to one word, and you can tell the story later. Have you expanded the visual vocabulary for U10 players? And the one word is triangulation, and we'll get yes. back to it. But Al does work with you 10 age kids to get them thinking. I mean, peer teaching, questioning, he's been doing for years. Yeah, th these are actually Wally seven and eight year olds. Yeah. And, and uh, it's amazing what they can do and what they do do. 